Hi, I'm Francis with Ant Lab Games, and today I'm bringing you Merchant's Cove. So this is a game that we actually played about a year ago. We did a full two-player playthrough, which we will link for you somewhere around here. And today I'm going over the four new characters, the four new merchants that are coming to the new expansion. So if you're not familiar with Merchant's Cove, this is an, uh, an asymmetrical uh, worker placement action selection game. Each of the merchants play very, very differently, and that's what's uh, so exciting about it. So let me take you through these four new characters, so starting with the detective. So again, if you're not familiar with Merchant's Cove, essentially you have these merchants out on the board, you have people coming in to the cove, and they're all either going to be selling something or providing some kind of service. So in the case of the detective, if I take you to the table here, we have uh, alibis and bounties. So this detective is going around, I guess, uh, posting bounties and um, taking alibis, I suppose. So uh, up here we have those. Now, how do you get those? What he's going to be doing is solving cases, and these cases are represented by these cards down here on his desk. So these are his current open cases, or her open cases that, that they are working. And how we're going to be doing these cases, essentially these are kind of transparent uh, cards and through the course of the actions which I'll go over in a moment you'll actually be able to take these and layer them on top of each other and the goal here is to complete a set of six uh, and complete the card once that is done then the case can be solved so going over our um, our actions here really quickly up at the top here, we have uh, recruit staff. So that's something everybody will be able to do, recruiting staff to this top portion up here. Um, and then we have uh, actually activating those staff. So I'll go over what they do in a moment. Each of the merchants is going to have staff that they can activate. Down here, this is going to be where you can gain an informant. Now, like I said before, we are going to be able to cover these up. And you might end up with a situation where you have this blank spot right here. and getting an informant is really great for solving cases so what you're going to do in that case is look at these top three stacks of uh, of case cards and if there are a certain number of coordinating colors then you'll be able to take that informant so in the first case you need to just have two of the same color showing and you can take that informant so right now we could potentially take a blue informant, we could take a green informant, we could take a yellow informant, could not take a red informant. The second one you take is gonna require three of the same color, and then the fourth one that you take will require uh, four of the same color and so on. So, uh, so that's what we're gonna do at that action there. Now we have this uh, pocket watch down here at the bottom, and this also has some actions on, and this is where we're really gonna do our card manipulation. So this, again, is a prototype, <laughs> as you can kind of see, the it's a little bit of a uh, dial here. But this is going to turn as we take these different actions and allow us to do different things. So the first action that we can take is to move one of these cards down below, as I've been doing to kind of illustrate things. So maybe we take this and we move it down here. And now we have, um, you know, just one more uh, uh, spot that we need to fill in. And maybe that helps us with the set collection that we're going for on that card. Um, here we can actually move uh, all of a stack of everything onto another one of these cases. So let's say I have a few um, cards sitting here on this case number two. I can actually move that over here. And now that case can be completed. And then when we're ready to actually solve the case, which will be this action down here, what we'll do is act, is take this off. So this is, let's say we're doing this when it's completed. We have six um, nicely filled out little cubes. Um, and this is actually how we're going to end up getting our alibis and our bounties or our large and small goods. So if we have uh, two matching symbols, which I do, I have two green and two yellow, I'll be able to get a green and a yellow small good. I also have these two black symbols, and what that's gonna do is, is get 
meet corruption, which is not great. But also I can use those uh, as any one symbol. So I could actually choose to use these two as another green and maybe get one of the large bounties. So coming down here to the bottom of the board, these actions are actually how we're going to take the pocket watch actions. So if you take this first one, um, that'll allow you to take one of these actions. This will allow you to take two of these actions, and this will allow you to take all three of those actions. Regardless of how many actions you take, you're always going to move this one click to the right clockwise. And then finally, our staff actions from left to right are an undercover agent. So that'll allow you to uh, take the solve pocket watch action, even if it's covered up. You will take the undercover spy, which is, again, just lets you move those cards from um, case to case. And then you have your undercover swap or undercover cop, excuse me, which lets you do this action of placing um, these case cards onto a case. And then finally, uh, security, which is discarding one corruption card of your choice. So that is the detective. Um, if you're into set collection, you like uh, transparent cards like I do, then uh, this is really cool use of them. So next, let me take you to the pastry chef. All right, for our next merchant, we have Ava Shortcake. So she is a uh, pastry chef extraordinaire, and uh, we'll be doing uh, gear and track management. If you're into that kind of thing, then you will uh, enjoy playing her. So let's take a look at the table and see what we've got here. So essentially we have Ava's bakery in front of us. And as all of the other merchants, we will be trying to sell large and small goods. The large goods obviously being worth more than the small goods. And her, her shelf, so where she's selling from, is actually going to be her oven. So we need to get these goods into this oven, push them up enough where they are baked enough that we can sell them without corruption. And we're going to do that by uh, using these mixing bowls that are uh, represented by these gears here. So our actions that we can take um, here are to uh, reset our uh, mixing track, which is this up here. You see, as we mix and mix and mix, we can eventually gain corruption. So we want to make sure we rest and reset that. We can take our mixing bowl plus three. So what, how this is going to work, and again, this is a prototype, um, but when you move this central dial, it's actually going to move the other dials on the outside, if you see how that works. And that is going to be central to how this character is going to play, because what we'll be able to do is actually take these actions over here and add batter to our mixing bowls. So we'll add our batter to one of these uh, batter icons here, right? Uh, depending on what orders come out. So we've got our stack of orders here, which will come out and tell us which mixing bowls we can actually put our batter into. And then as these move uh, along the track here, um, and I'm not demonstrating this very well because they are cardboard. <laughs> um, as these guys move here, uh, we'll be able to take them out of the mixing bowls and take the action associated with where they are on the track. So if we're up here, let's say our, our um, you know, our batter cube has traveled all the way up here as we're turning this around. This indicates that we'll be able to load a total of three or move um, up to three of that color good in our oven. So maybe we decide to bring in, um, you know, one small good and maybe we already have one small good cooking here and we want to move that up too. So now we're using our total of three to move our goods up uh, up our oven track. Now uh, maybe we don't want to stop there. Maybe we want to gain even more points. Um, so what you could do is also uh, take maybe the frosting action. And what taking frosting does is allows you to take a frosting of a color that is, uh, is not associated with uh, one of the goods that you have here. And if we have that in our, let's take the top one first. If we have that over here uh, kind of waiting, we can put that right on top. Um, and now that good has some frosting on it. Now that, that good won't be able to move anymore, but when we sell it, it, it gets sold with frosting. And what selling a good with frosting allows us to do is to sell it to patrons of those colors. Because again, if you're familiar with how Merchant's Cove works, the patrons want things uh, that are the same color as the patron. So uh, the other thing this frosting does for you is if you do unlock these, 
this will actually give you that faction reputation as well. So it's behoove you to put lots of nice frosting on your delicious, scrumptious items. And just like everybody else, Ava has staff actions that the staff can take. So we have a sugar wizard who can load a batter into any, mix, any mixer or gain one frosting of any color. We have a whisker, which is important, uh, to rotate the central mixer mixer two ticks clockwise. Say that five times fast. We have an oven manager who can remove up to two batter from the mixers to take mixer actions. Again, that's going to be uh, basically wherever your batter cube is. That's the action that you'll be able to take. And then uh, security discarding corruption card of uh, the player's choice. So that's Ava the Baker. Uh, this is definitely one that I would be into because I like to bake. And uh, I like the idea of kind of moving these gears around and, and taking those actions. It's pretty neat. So uh, next, let's go to the Mushroom Farmer. All right, so let's talk about the Mushroom Farmer. Uh, this is probably uh, the most complex of the four, at least in my opinion. And uh, this Mushroom Farmer does not have a little uh, figurine. They're actually using uh, little animals to go out and do their bidding. So let's take a look at the table and see what we have going on here. All right, so a couple of concepts kind of to understand about, about this here. Again, we have our large goods and small goods, which are going to be mushrooms that we'll be selling to patrons. And as I mentioned, the Mushroom Farmer does not have a figure going out and doing things. Uh, but instead is, is kind of using these insects to go around and do some things in the, um, I guess, in the soil, right? So we have these tiles, and I'm not sure if you can see, but these are actually like little hexes um, that are being placed here. And those are going to represent kind of our dirt or our soil, and they actually have a, uh, a dirt side and a mushroom side. So right now you can see these are on the dirt side, and when they're flipped they have little mushrooms starting to grow on there and uh, they'll actually get spores and those spores are what we're going to use to collect put in our uh, kind of grow box and grow us some mushrooms to sell so that's how that's going to work and uh, each of these insects like i said is going to have a role in producing the spores that we need to take over here to grow the mushrooms that we're eventually going to sell and then start the whole cycle all over again now what's really unique about the Mushroom Farmer as well is that we have these action tiles uh, here and these are more or less in your hand. So when you take an action, you're actually going to assign one of these action tiles to the action that you're going to take. And why that's important is that at the beginning of your turn, you can do what's called a recall. And when you recall, you'll actually be able to take the action tiles that are played back into your hand and that will give you a bonus hopefully a bonus um, or might even give you corruption if you don't take enough so uh, so that's a little bit different uh, because the way that the board is set up uh, we don't have the action spaces that you see on the other board so I wanted to quickly explain how that how that worked and why why it looks so different so our action tiles here allow us to do a number of things. First of all, we can swap an insect with any other insect, and then the insect that was swapped can move one space. Uh, we can move two spaces with the insect that we assigned to this tile, move three spaces, move any number of spaces in one direction, or simply move to any space, and then also uh, initiate a growth cycle. So I'll talk about that means in a minute. Let's go over what each of the insects do. So first we have the snail, which is right down here. And what the snail is able to do is turns uh, shroom tiles into fresh dirt. So again, the shroom tile is going to be this flipped over version of the tile back into dirt like that. And uh, it can also exchange up to four adjacent shroom tiles with tiles from compost right here. And why that's important is because you'll notice that these tiles have different colors on them. And those colors are going to be associated with the color mushrooms that we get to make um, and or the spores, I guess, that we get to create. And then the spores determine the kind of mushrooms that we're going to make. So uh, that's why that's advantageous to switch these out with the compost there. Um, when we move the tiles to the compost, they're going to lose any spores that are on them, obviously, and then tiles moved from the compost are going to be placed dirt side up. So not spore side up, but dirt side up here. 
Okay, and then next we have the worm. So the worm is going to flip the dirt side uh, tiles to shroom side tiles. So now they can uh, collect spores and we'll be using those spores later on. Uh, the worm always gains one additional movement. So when the worm moves, they're gonna gain a movement and they're flipping these uh, based on the tile that they're moving off of. So they actually have to you know, work their way through the soil in order to, uh, to get it uh, flipped to its shroom side, I guess. The moth we have up here uh, collects spores from the farm and places them in the spore box over here. And then uh, it, it, we can actually do that up to, we can place up to four spores from adjacent spaces into the spore box here. And we have a little guide down here that, whoops, kind of tells you what, uh, what it is you're able to do as well. And then of course we have the firefly. So the firefly is actually gonna be triggering our growth cycle and uh, we'll generate one white spore and I'll explain what that does in a moment here. Let's see, our, our spore field is a little bit of a mess right now. <laughs> A little little earthquake let's talk about a growth cycle so let's pretend like we have some stuff going on here let's say we've got some mushrooms in here already um, let's say we have a couple of spores right so we'll take like two spores there okay. um, so when we do our growth cycle our large mushrooms are actually going to turn into two small mushrooms of the same color so that'll come back and two small mushrooms will come out why do you want to do that? Uh, there's reasons for it. <laughs> you might uh, want to sell those those small items, and this is a way that you can do that. So uh, small mushrooms are going to be turned into matching color large mushrooms. So these two will be turned into a large mushroom there. Uh, if we had white spores here, the two white spores would turn into one spore of any other color. So it works kind of like the, um, the, uh, the detective's black uh, squares in a way um, where they're going to gain corruption and in fact we have black spores out here too so those will also turn into uh, uh, two spores of any color but they need to be the same color and you're going to draw corruption for doing that um, every two matching spores are going to turn into a small good so this is going to turn into a small mushroom like so and then at this point we can remove any spores of our choice and put them on our sale rack so I could decide to take this uh, large mushroom off of here. I could decide to take these two small ones, obviously, because I just made them. Um, and then I could leave this here if I want to. Maybe I want to try and generate another small red mushroom and then turn it into a large red mushroom. And all of that is going to happen on subsequent growth cycles. Okay, and finally, as always, we have our staff up here. And so here for the uh, mushroom farmer, we have a spore tender. So placing one spore of any color from the supply into the spore box. Uh, second, we have a cultivator. So we can just start a growth cycle, just like the firefly does. The uh, hypnotist recalls tiles, including the one played on this action. And you gain a reward as if you had recalled plus one tile. Uh, and then finally, as always, we have security, which discards corruption. Now, when we're talking about recalling these uh, tiles, as I mentioned, we're gonna play a certain number of these. So let's say these were the three that I decided to play this round. These two are still in my hand. And at the beginning of my next turn, I can choose to recall tiles that I've already played. If I choose to recall all three of these, I wanna check this box over here and see if I have a reward and in the case of re returning three of them, I don't, but had I returned four or five, I would have gotten a reward for that. All right, so that is our mushroom farmer. Uh, probably the, like I said, the most complex uh, one, but interesting because if you're really into, uh, you know, turning things into other things and turning goods into other goods, um, I, you know, if you like the idea of this placement that and the actions that kind of need to happen in a certain order and then getting that machine kind of going and and expediting things as much as you can then this is probably you know a good a good merchant for you to explore uh finally we've got one more and that is the treasure diver all right and finally we have our treasure diver so uh, this is going to be a straight up bag builder and works a little bit differently than the others, uh, of course. So let's take a look at the table and I'll show you what's going on here. So we're gonna be bag building. This is really a uh, press your luck, 
uh, bag builder. So we have our bag, um, and you'll see we have a bunch of tokens all over the place. Uh, we are selling jewelry and, and kind of these like tiki guys who remind me of uh, like the Brady Bunch, <laughs> uh, if anybody remembers that, that episode. Um, but what we're going to be doing is having our, uh, our diver uh, dive for resources, uh, hopefully pulling things out to fill up these backpacks and then uh, and not busting so uh, busting in terms of uh, what's going on here means the diver is going to start here and as the diver pulls 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 we're hoping that uh, the diver doesn't uh, bust by hitting this very last spot uh, if that happens then we're the player is going to have to get rid of a bunch of things that they probably want to keep uh, but hopefully they stop before they bust and uh, are able to keep uh, a lot of good a lot of good things so uh, so to kind of show you how that works or illustrate that really quickly if we wanted to take a dive we would actually start here um, and then we'll draw a number of tokens um, I would declare you know that I'm going to try to fill this bag we have a bag with three spots a bag with four spots and a bag with five um, so I would take out my four tokens and see what happens so according to uh, what tokens I pull are going to tell us what what's going to happen here so I have a a three crab, another crab, a two crab, oh my goodness, and a coin. So our crabs here are gonna go in the crab section. Um, so we're gonna go right over here, like this. Um, now my diver's actually gonna move down on the tr on the uh, diving track for each crab that I drew. So that's a total of three. One, two, three. And then this coin will actually go into my pack. All right. So at this point, my dive is done, and I can well, I can decide whether or not I want to continue the dive or uh, or stop. But I have three spots left to fill. I'm not quite halfway down this diving track, so I'll draw three more and see what happens here. Aha! There we go. All right. So crab again is going to go here. He's going to come down one. My lantern is actually going to move this lantern token down here, and then this will go where that lantern token moved from, and that'll make more sense um, in a little bit. And then my coins are gonna go here, and I could keep on going, and I will just take two more. This is the longest dive, one and two. All right, so I got gems and coins, perfect. So gem and coins, great. Um, so my dive is done, I'll end my dive there. And then I just unload my pack. So we have two sections on our shore board here. We have a north shore and a south shore. And we have various actions that we can take on both the uh, both the shores. And we need to unload our pack into one of these two shores. So that will be what we need to decide to do here. Uh, the north shore primarily is where we're gonna purchase new tokens for our bag. So against the bag builder, we get our tokens from the board here. Uh, so we'll want to get those into our bag down at the south shore that's where we're actually going to make our stuff that we're going to sell so uh, we need money and gems to do both maybe i'll just unload these here we're not playing we're not playing for real i just kind of want to illustrate to you guys what's going on okay next on the diver's turn they could take map actions so they're going to be able to take as many map actions as there are maps above where the diver is located so right now there's only one map they can take one map action. And those map actions are gonna to be to recruit townsfolk or to find new coins. So you'll notice that there are, uh, there's not an action on the divers board for recruiting townsfolk or actually activating townsfolk because it works a little bit differently. So I could choose to recruit townsfolk. I need to spend a map and an additional map for each staff member I already have, I have no staff. Um, and I also have no maps, so I won't be taking this action. But should, if I did have a map, I could I could definitely do that. And when the staff come in up here, I actually just get to add this to my bag, and that's it. So um, there is no activating them, but you get the bonus of taking that token into your bag and, and further building it. I could decide also to use that map token to buy coins or to buy gems, and I just have to spend um, as many maps as um, as uh, tokens or, or coins indicated on the token that I'm taking and then that goes right in my bag as well. 
So to kind of go over what we're doing on the North and South Shore here too, on the South Shore, like I said, we're creating goods. So you can create, um, a, a, you could use two coins and a gem. So I could theoretically do like this, two coins and a gem to create a small good that matches the color of the gem. Obviously I have a wild, so I can make any color I want to. Um, and then if I wanted to take the hut action, uh, to create large goods, I would need to turn uh, three coins and two matching gems into a large good. Uh, the dark hut, which is this one here, will allow us to exchange resources. So I could say, okay, I want to put these two up here and take uh, maybe actions at the North Shore next time. Um, so up at the North Shore, we can uh, buy these lanterns and those will go in the diving bag. And again, the lanterns just come out here and push this lantern token down further and further. Um, and we can also buy maps, which you already saw why those are so important. Um, you can also buy nets and then move resources again. So these nets will open up um, more spaces for crabs. So that is our friend the diver, and that concludes all four of our new merchants for the expansion uh, coming to Kickstarter. So as I mentioned, we have played Merchant's Cove in the past, and uh, you can check out that playthrough. It'll give you a better idea of uh, how the game plays and how all these seemingly very asymmetric merchants work. Well, not really work together, but work together in the sense of how the game plays. Uh, you're really kind of competing in very different ways for a common goal, and it's neat to see all of that actually come together. So. Um, so that's, uh, that's that. Information on the Kickstarter will be down below. Uh, link to the Kickstarter will be below as well. If you have any questions about uh, kind of how these, how these work, let us know. Um, as always, we like to engage with you guys in the comments. Uh, join us on our Patreon, on our Discord, on our Facebook, and all the other social places that Anthony usually likes to plug. So uh, for now, and I guess for always, I'm Francis with Ant Lab Games, and I will see you next time.